Should we just pray for these guys as they go? Um, Father, thank you that you're full of goodness and that you're for us. And so we just ask, Lord, for the tinies and then for the teenagers, God, that they would know you revealing yourself to them. That your goodness and your kindness and your mercy would be pursuing them. And they would respond in their hearts to receive all that you have to give them this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I'm Tom and what we're going to do today, we've been looking at the life of David, but we're just going to take a little break from that because we just want to introduce and talk a little bit more about one of the key things we think God's asking us to do uh, as a church. And um, in the new year, which is eight Sundays away, unbelievably, eight Sundays, uh, we're going to have on s- at six o'clock in the evening our first Croydon Vineyard Sunday evening service. It's going to be 6 o'clock till 7.30 here uh, in a eight weeks time, the 7th of January, eight Sundays between now and then. And, and we just want to talk you through a little bit about why, because we think this communicates the DNA of us as people of Jesus and of us as Croydon Vineyard. Um, and we're going to issue you an invitation to say, would you like to be part of these 6 p.m.? services. Um, so that's where we're going. You might think of, well, well, why? Why bother? Why do a six o'clock service? We've got a 10.30 service. Uh, it works. You know, kind of like we can, we can get in the room. Uh, we can listen to some great music and join in and worship. We can hear some talks, uh, which generally we like. And we can pray for one another, though. Why bother? Uh, especially when we've heard just a few weeks ago that money's a bit tight, um, that, you know, there's plenty of things to be doing in life. I'm busy, you're busy, my agenda's full, your agenda's full. Why would we bother doing something new, something significant, uh, a significant new commitment like starting a six o'clock service? Um, well, I just want to take us to the book of Romans, at the start of Romans. Um, and I just want to read this out because I think this shows us how we make decisions in the kingdom of Jesus and what our priorities are in the kingdom of Jesus. It says, it says this, this is Paul speaking to the church in Rome, a church he's probably never been to. He may have known a few of the people who were there, but he's probably never actually visited Rome. He says, I long to see you so I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. I wanted to do this in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other nations, the other Gentiles. I am obligated, he says, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile, then to the nations, people of all nations, that's what Gentile means. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I just want to put a few things out about this. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of anyone who believes. And we kind of come into that verse and we love bits of it and we're going to get onto bits of it in a minute. But the thing that really strikes me first of all is, it's for those who believe. And some don't believe. Some don't believe yet. And in Croydon, there's many, many people who do not yet believe in Jesus. The census tells us that it's approaching 400,000 people who live in Croydon. And uh, if you were to sort of forget boundaries of boroughs and just sort of think about geographical location and access, to somewhere like St Andrew's School where we are, or somewhere to the, like the centre of Croydon, which is kind of a hub of where we're trying to do our mission. Within 30 minutes travel, 
which is probably about the limit most people would travel to church. 30 minutes travel, there's over a million people. Uh, and many, many of those people do not believe, they do not know Jesus. That again, the, uh, these statistics are hard to find uh, and hard to know if they're really accurate, but the suggestion is that something up to 35,000 people in Croydon attend a church in some manner. 35,000. And uh, that means that there's 365,000 people in Croydon who do not attend a church. Now, there's probably about 10,000 of those people who are Christians but somehow have become displaced. And I know many of you are in that category 6, 12, 18, 24, 36 months ago. You're people who you, you, you believe in Jesus but somehow you're separated from his body and so you find yourself shriveling up and shrinking and your belief and your faith is waning in, in the vast majority of cases. And so Jesus calls his people, wherever they are, to help people believe. To help people believe. You know, there's no joy in heaven at looking at 365,000 people who don't believe. There's no joy in that. And, uh, and that was one of the core convictions that Leslie and I felt when we felt called to Croydon uh, about five and a half years ago now. We really felt clear that God was asking us to come here. And as he was asking us to come here, uh, the calling was to find people who don't believe and help them believe. We want to help people believe, right? We want to help people find salvation. I remember we came to Croydon. I, I travelled over and I didn't really know the area, so walking around. And, and as I was walking around the centre of town, I was like, Lord, is this really where you want us to be? Uh, there's so many churches in Croydon that seem to be doing really well. You know, why, do, why another one? Why, why, why do you want another one? What, what is it about here? And as I was walking along, um, uh, this woman comes up to me. Just, she just comes up to me. And she goes, oh, do you know where the council building is? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, this is my first time here, really. I don't know Croydon. Um, I guess it's probably near here, but you'll have to ask somebody else. And she, she said, I swear, this is not a lie. She went like this, I'm lost. I'm lost. And she started crying. I'm lost. And she ran off. And I was like... Okay, maybe you're saying something to me through this, Jesus. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe you are. Uh, who knows? And, and then I was walking back to the station, to East Croydon Station. There used to be a visitor centre there. Do you remember? Like now it's Box Park where there used to be a visitor centre. And, and as I just thought, I'll go and have a look in here. And as I wandered in there, um, this woman came into the visitor centre. And she was... <laughs> and, the, and the lady was like, are you okay? And she could barely speak. And, and she said, you know, like, I, she had immense breathing difficulties. She just couldn't breathe. And she, I don't know whether she was having an asthma attack or something, but there was just something major going on. I was like, again, just, do you know what? There's people in Croydon who are lost and who are struggling to breathe, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And Jesus wants them to, to be set free, to be saved, to be found, not just to be left in that place and so as as a church we feel that just relying on people coming and visiting us for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning that's never going to be enough it's never going to be enough and we want to our dream is that over time we have more and more services and more and more locations all around Croydon so that we're just easy for people to find us but of course it's not just about people coming in is it it's also about as we go it's as we live in our workplaces, as in our neighbourhood, as we meet people when we're shopping. and It's that. It's, it's, it's more than just people coming in here. But it is something significant about coming in here. Um, so I want to look a little bit about salvation. Because I think salvation is a word that we, we, we can sometimes not quite know what it means to be saved. You know, somebody will look at you and be like, are you saved? And you're like, well, I, guess, I guess so. Um, and they might, you know, what does he mean anymore? Do we even know what he means? Well, there's three things that the Bible talks about. Three f primary metaphors that it uses for talking about what salvation is. And I've reworded them slightly, but I think the first one is Jesus reclaims you. God reclaims you in Jesus. You see, 
When Jesus died on the cross, what he was doing, it was like he was putting up a sign of like a lost dog. Have you ever seen like a photo somebody puts up of a lost dog on a, you know, on a tree? You know, missing, it will say, won't it? Missing. And there'll be a picture of the dog. And, and even if the dog is like the most aggressive, nasty, ugly dog, the photo will be of it. You know, a lovely looking dog. It's like missing. And on the cross, it's like Jesus goes and he finds this missing dog, which to be honest has probably wandered off. It's not missing, it's, like it's, it's chosen to run away. But he goes and finds it and says, I'm going to reclaim you. You know, don't live anymore in the corner, living off scraps, you know, like hungry, unloved, you know, in danger of being run over by traffic. He finds, the photo, he puts the photo out and then he goes, finds and just says, come on, come back home. And he takes you back home. And the way the Bible puts that is, it says, we're all like sheep have gone astray. Not many of us really know that much about sheep, but it's like a dog, it run off. You run off. Sometimes you've chosen to do it. Sometimes you did it by accident, but you've run off. And he comes, he says, okay, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna bring you back. I'm bringing you back home. And he, and he brings you back into the family home. He reclaims you. He reclaims you, he says, you are mine. You are a child of God. I claim you back as my child. Come and live in my house. So salvation is God reclaiming you. The second thing is God renaming you. God brings salvation through Jesus by renaming you. He renames you. You see, I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever done this thing where you type into Google your name? Like search and see what comes up. Yeah, like Tom Thompson, and you discover, oh, there's all these Tom Thompsons who are way more popular and successful than me. <laughs> <sighs> I wish I hadn't done that. And then like, you then search other people's names. You know, just and then sometimes when you search a name because it's quite an unusual name, the actual friend of yours actually comes up as one of the top hits. So you, you know, it's actually them. It's not just somebody who's got their name. But imagine if you searched your name on Google and every single thought, every single comment, every single action you'd ever done came up. It wasn't all the different Tom Thompsons, it was just you. Your name. And every single thing you'd ever done comes up. And they're saying now, and if you're a parent of teenagers, this is something that presumably your conversation you've already had, you know, once you put something out there online, you, you really can never take it back. You know, so you have teenagers who are taking photos of themselves naked, sexting it and sending it to somebody else, it never comes back. And it just gets out there and Google, Google it up and you can't control it. Equally, some statements you've made about people. Something that you tried to make as a joke, and yet it came across wrong. All these things, and, and what happens in our society now is that so many of us, we carry around all this kind of catalogue of pain associated with our name. All the things people have said about you, how they've defined you, how they've labelled you. And, and Jesus in his salvation, it's like he takes, he takes you and he renames you. He gives you a new name. And now when that new name of yours is searched, the hit is this, blameless, pure, righteous, loved, faithful. The delight, delighted in by the Father, beloved. No longer an orphan. He changes your name. That's what salvation is. So salvation is God reclaiming you. Salvation is God renaming you. And salvation is God restoring you. Restoring you. 
Through the Holy Spirit's work, he brings the power of God to heal your heart, to restore you to the image of him that he placed in you at the beginning of creation. He restores you. He changes your life. Have you ever watched this program? I think it's called Salvage Hunters. Have you seen that? Have you seen Salvage Hunters? There's like this, you know, this kind of bloke, and he walks around, the, goes around the UK, and he goes, often he goes to um, antique shops, and he'll find a particular antique, and, and he'll buy it, because you can see he can make some money out of it. So he'll buy that particular antique, and he'll take it back to his workshop, and then he has like his team who do restoration. And they use special waxes and special woods and special materials. And what they do is they take this old stool, which is kind of one of the legs is cracked and the seat is broken. And just lovingly, carefully, really meticulously, they restore it. And that's what God does with you. He restores you slowly, meticulously, deliberately. He won't just use any old nonsense. He won't just take any old thing. And No, no. He, he uses the right materials to restore you to the image for which he created you. When we say in this church, come to life, what that is is the restoring of God to cr- make you back to how he always intended you to be. He's restoring you. Do you know there's lots of lost dogs out there, aren't there? Don't you just meet them all the time? Sometimes they're angry and aggressive because they've not been fed properly and they've not been loved and they've been kicked around a bit and they they have a go at you. And Jesus says, come on, let's reclaim them. Let me reclaim them. Let me bring them back in and love them. Don't you think there's many people out there who just carry shame? They just carry so much shame. They've just had so many things said on them. Like insecurity is rife. Their name is associated with so much negativity in their minds. Jesus wants to rename them. He wants to use you and he wants to use this church to rename people. Don't you think there's so many people out there who've been told that they're just like a naff old stool that could just be thrown away and just replaced with a different one? That their value, just let's just treat you however we want to treat you because who cares? I'll just replace you. And they need to know that Jesus looks at them and says, no, you're like a masterpiece. You're like an antique. You're like this thing that's, yeah, you've got damage, but let me come and restore you. Let me come and recreate you. Let me come and put back into you all those things that were meant to be there, that sin and all the horrors of life have have ravaged in you. Let Let me restore you. To me, that is still good news, isn't it? Isn't it good news? Don't you just... You know, people who you might walk up to them and say, are you saved? And they'd be like... Go away. But when you say, do you know, do you you want to be, you want to have somebody who loves you no matter what? Do you want to have somebody who will work for your good, who really knows you, who really understands you, who can place back into you all these things that you were made for? That's good news. See, God really wants many, many people to find salvation in him. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of every person who believes. It doesn't just stop there, though, you see. See, once you've you've come to Jesus, once you've understood this gospel, once it's been given to you like a deposit in your life, it does something to you. And Paul says it this way, he says, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. See, I'm obligated, and the word in, in, that he uses is like, a, I'm a debtor. I'm like a debtor. So say, for example, I borrowed, say this was uh, Dio's Bible here, I borrowed. Uh, 
I'm in debt to him until I give it back to him. I know, that's what debt is. Yeah? So I, I'd come and give it back to him. Say, well, thanks for lending this to me. I, my debt's free. But what about if I give this to Dio and I say, Dio, look, this is, this is Rob's Bible. Could you, could you give him the Bible? He, he's a debtor, isn't he? He's a debtor to Rob until he's given Rob the Bible. And you see what, what God has done is he's given you the most precious treasure. You know, like instead of a Bible, say it was a hundred pounds. You kind of, you want to get that done, don't you? You want to get that done. And the gospel is the greatest treasure of all. Yes. Oh. And he says to you, here's the gospel. Go give it to the people who you know. And like, it's like a debt to them. It's like a debt to them. It's the word he uses. Yeah, and I think this makes a big difference when we think, what is, what is it we aim for as a church? Just think about what are we aiming for as a church? Like, we could aim for really great music, and we want great music. A good church. What's a good church? Oh, is your church a good church? Oh, the music's really good. What's a good church? Oh, well, we have nice cakes. You know, there's some nice biscuits served. What's a good church? Is your church a good church? Well, yeah, there's lots of people. It's growing. It's a good, yeah, it's, you know, there's lots of people who come. What's a good church? Oh, well, they preach the word well. What's a good church? A good church is this. A good church is a church that pays the debt it owes to the community around it. A good church is a church that sees the people who are around it who don't believe and say, hey, look. Look what we've been entrusted for you. This is for you. That's a good church. We want to be a good church. We want to be a faithful church. We want to be a church who says, you know, we won't sit comfortable on, does this work? But we want to pass on to the people of Croydon the message, the gospel, the good news, that they can be reclaimed, they can be renamed, they can be restored. And so for us, we want to keep on creating more spaces where people can come into to hear that. More communities where they can not just hear it, but feel it. They can not just hear it, not just feel it, but they can join in with it and begin to live it. For us, that's our definition of a good church. What's a good Christian? I don't know where you sit. I don't know if you even would call yourself a Christian. Our hope is that every single Sunday there'll be people here who don't call themselves Christians. We want you to be here because we want you to explore and discover Jesus. But maybe you kind of, maybe you have in your idea what a mature Christian looks like. You kind of, this is what a mature Christian looks like. This is what they look like. Do you know, I recently, uh, I, I talk about this a lot, I know. I, I recently joined a gym, and they do this thing where they, they give you, like, they offer for free, amazingly, an MOT on your health. So what they do, what you do is you go in and they kind of they stick needles in you and they take like your blood pressure and they take your cholesterol level and they take your pulse rate and they do all this kind of stuff. And then they come out and they like come out with, this is how healthy you are. How, you know, how much water do you drink in a day and how much exercise do you do, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and they did this test on me. Right? And they sort of, and then they come out with a number like this is how healthy you are. And, it, and it's really annoying <laughs> because, you know, if it's your cholesterol level, it's your cholesterol level. It, it just, and they came out and then the results came through and, I, and they're like, oh, well, I, you know, I've got some good news for you. You're, you're like in the top 40% of, of men for your age. Now, if you know me, I was disgusted. <laughs> I was like, sorry, did you say 40% or 14%? Because I would just naturally assume I'm in the top 4 or 
of people from my age. Now listen to me. I wasn't doing any exercise. I wasn't eating very well. And I wasn't sleeping very well, but I still just thought I must be one of, you know, I must be one of the most healthy people from my age. 40%. It can often happen in the spiritual world as well, can't it? I must be one of the most mature Christians I know. I must be one of the most mature Christians I know. Or they must be one of the most mature Christians I know. They always know the answer of a small group. What's a mature Christian? I want to suggest to you that there's... There's various different things here, but one which we often don't factor in. A mature Christian is somebody who's, who's giving, paying the debt to the people around them. Who's passing on the gospel to the people in their lives. Who's nurturing and feeding and in growing the people closest to them. That's why one of the criteria for Christian leadership is that they have to have a good family. Because if they can't even nurture and grow and pass on the gospel to those closest to them, what hope have they got to pass on to anyone else? So how would you pass on the debt if you, the debt you've been given the gospel? Well, it's courageous invitation. It's just courageous invitation over and over and over again. Do you know, six years ago, all that existed of Croydon Vineyard was an invitation. Six years ago, I felt like God had said we should plant a church. And so I went and invited my wife. Should we go and do this thing? And Leslie said, let me think about it. She thought about it. And then she said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Six years ago, all that existed of Croydon Vineyard was an invitation from my lips to one person. And before that, even what existed was an invitation from the Holy Spirit to me. And then all that changed in Croydon Vineyard is that the courageous invitation was then issued to Phil and Caroline. And yes, they took on. And then to others. Michael and Alison and some people around our house. It, it just the invitation was issued, whether that's through the website, whether that's through word of mouth, whether that's through... Courageous, you just courageously invite people. All we have got is an invitation. There's nothing else. We just courageously invite people. And so we used to go out when we first started the church. We just said we don't know anybody in Croydon, so we've got to find some way of inviting people. So we just go on the high street. Invite as many people as we could. And 99% of them said no. But it didn't matter, because it's still about 1%. And I want to just tell you again, there is immense power in invitation. There's also power in manipulation, but that power is a negative power. Not manipulation, but invitation. Invitation. Hey, would you like to come to an evening service? I know your kids play sport on a Sunday morning, so it's, you've never been able to make it, or you work shifts, and you're often over, working overnight on a Saturday night. You know, my church is starting a new six o'clock service. Would you like to come? I think it, you, might, you might find it valuable. You might like it. What do you think? It's just an invitation. Do you want to come and join Neil's team at bowling on Friday night? There's this bloke in our church. And, you know, he needs some people on his team. You'd be doing him a favour. It's an invitation. Now, sin will tell you it's courageous for this reason. It's not. It's courageous invitation because sin will tell you that they won't be interested, and sin will tell you that you can't do it well enough. So you can't issue the invitation well enough, and sin will tell you there's something better to do instead. Look at your life. Look how busy you are. You, know, you still haven't finished that box set of West Wing. You know, it's been there for years. <laughs> you're paying this money for Netflix. And if you don't use it, you're wasting it. You know, God wants you to be a good steward. So you need to use what you, you know. It's 
You see, the thing is that um, if it was you who came up with the invitation, it would matter whether you could give it or not well, wouldn't it? It would matter whether you could give it well or not. Uh, again, another illustration of me at the gym. When I was at the gym, uh, was a, I don't know if you ever have been into sort of, it's, it's called like the heavy weights room, which is intimidating in itself. It took me several weeks just to actually go into the heavy weights room. But there was a bench press and I wanted to make my chest look bigger so that everyone would look at it and think it looks bigger. So that was, you know, that was really the main reason I joined the gym. So I've got to go in there eventually. So I went in and there was this guy who was doing bench press. So okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it a go. And he had on, they have like different sizes of weights and there was like a 20 kilogram one on one and then 10. So he had 30 on that end and then a 20 kilogram and a 10 on that end. The bar. I was like, well, I'm not as big as him. So I'll take the 10s off at each end and I'll just do 20 on each end. So, um, you know, there's quite a lot of big guys in there. And so I walk in. And then you have to lie down. It takes quite a while because you have to get yourself in a position. You're like, you know, hold on, just get round out the bar. And so I lay down on that. I was like, <laughs> and the thing would not move. <laughs> it just totally wouldn't move. And I was like, oh, I've got to get up in front of everybody now and take these weights off. And because there's only 20 on at each end, I had to take all the weights off and then find some more smaller ones and put them on. It's like 10 on each end. And I was like, 10 on each end? This is easy. I should easily be able to do this. So I get back down. You know, I won't risk putting 15. I'll just do 10. So I get, I get back down. You know, and you can sort of see a few people are looking, but... I've committed. It's too late. I can't like walk out now. Just follow it through. So I go down and, and I was like, you know, you wouldn't believe how heavy 10 kilograms on each head can feel. When you've already like strained yourself so massively. So so it's like so it's, it's down like that. And the problem, the problem is, it's way easier for the weight to come down than it for us to go back up. <laughs> so I was there, and this thing I was sitting on my chest, and I couldn't, I was like, <gasps> and I couldn't move it up. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, and I look across next to me, right, I hope this doesn't come across in the wrong way, but next to me, there was a lady lifting 15 on each end. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, and I, and I just got one end up, and then the other end up, and on. And I was like, I'm never coming back in this heavyweight room again. <laughs> it's rubbish. But I'll tell you what, that night when I went home, my wife said to me, could you open this jar top because I can't get the lid off? <laughs> and I testify to this. I could remove the lid of the jar. <laughs> the thing was this. That gorilla who was lifting 30 kilograms on each end, <laughs> he wasn't available to open the lid of the jar for my wife. Even the lady, the 60-year-old lady next to me who was lifting 15 kilograms on each end, she wasn't available to open the lid of the jar for my wife. Gordon Walker might give the invitation better than you do. Andy Brims might give the invitation better than you do. But they don't live where you live. They don't meet the people that you meet. And you've been given a precious, precious, the most precious thing, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, God will bring into your life people who have nobody else who can open the jar lid for them. And you, with your weak and meagre and stumbling effort to invite them, 
will actually do the job for them when nobody else is doing it. It's Remembrance Sunday. Remember those who went to war. And I think Jesus is calling us to go to war. Our war is not with guns and bombs. But our war is with loving actions and courageous words of invitation. It's not about the kingdom of this world that we manipulate and force others to get what we want. It's about the kingdom that is not of this earth, that we invite and we serve, that Croydon as a town can be changed, that people can find salvation in the name of Jesus. That's why we want to do a six o'clock service. So we just want to, over the next few weeks, we're just going to increasingly invite you and say, do you want to be part of this thing? Could you bring your humble and meager offerings to invite people along or to come and say, yeah, I'm going to come and I'll click the button to change the screen for the projector on the words or I'll smile. You know, I can't smile. Now, when I smile, it comes across like this. <laughs> but I'll come and do it for Jesus. Shall we pray?